time is made, not given. It is neither a cosmic constant nor a form of intuition that is somehow wired or programmed into human nature. Instead, time emerges from the ways we find things to be constituted, to relate to each other, and the ways we find ourselves connected in society and with the things that make up the world. Time, therefore, is also variable. That does not mean, however, that time is merely an illusion, a fictitious construct, a product of our imagination we can change or annihilate at will. There is no way to live without time. The question can only be what kinds of time we live in, live with and live by. That again may not be a matter of choice or only to a very limited extent. This is how I would describe an essential consensus in the theory and philosophy of time as it has evolved since the 1920s. I take thinkers as different as Edmund Husserl and Richard Hönigswald, Martin Heidegger and Ernst Kassira, J.T. Fraser and Paul Ricoeur, or in Japan, Omori Shozo and Maki Yusuke, to be well within the purview of this consensus, despite of all their great differences. And the same holds for Uchiyama Takashi and his book 12 Chapters on Time, the subject of my talk today. Uchiyama, born in 1950, is an autodidact who divides his time between cultivating land in a remote mountain village and studying, lecturing, and writing. My interest in this author and his book arose when I noticed that he had, over the years, investigated four topics in interconnection that are often treated in separation, labor, money, time, and nature. Picking up his book, my expectations rose as I learned from its table of contents that you try and translate it here, um, that it dealt with the time of mountain villages as well as that of bourgeois society, the time of the forest as well as that of commodity production, and furthermore with relational as well as reified concepts of time was bringing together his own experience as a country dweller with his readings of theory and not least Marx, which is always a good and indeed indispensable choice when discussing modern society. Browsing on, I was immediately drawn into reading the first chapter on river time. Uchiyama here describes how when he was a child in Musashino in the 1950s, there were still plenty of smaller and larger waters, brooks, rivulets, ditches, and rivers, all of which had their own often varying speeds. This was the result of a method of water management in place since the Edo period, which aimed to keep water inland and distribute it far and wide. As Uchiyama recounts, the landscape then underwent a rapid and substantial change in the 1960s. Structures were put in place to collect excess water and lead it outward to the sea in a rapid, even flow. Many small rivers were converted into underground channels in the process and became invisible as a consequence. Uchiyama draws a parallel between the old waterscape and the rhythmic time of early modern agriculture a time that united the people, the land, and the rivers on the one hand, and between the standardized even flow of the newly regulated rivers and the homogeneous, extraneous time of modern social life on the other hand. The point that I found compelling about Uchiyama's account and that made me read on was that he does not simply describe the old landscape and time as somehow more natural and intuitive than the modern technocratic and rationalized version. He is clear that both are the product of human planning and intervention. 
and he demonstrates that he understands the rationality behind both. This made me hope that his further elaborations would continue to avoid facile dichotomies between intuitive and rational, authentic and derivative time, the usual well-worn fare of bourgeois critique of modernity a la Kyoto School or Heidegger. Unfortunately, the book does not entirely live up to that expectation, but it has a couple of valuable insights to offer on which I intend to focus my talk. The core argument of the book, mainly developed in its chapters five to eight, may be summarized as follows. So there is an antithesis, uh, which is to treat time as a natural given, which is appropriately measured according to the met methods of the natural sciences and accounted for by the clock. Time progresses at a constant speed in a homogeneous flow. Uh, the thesis that opposes this antithesis is that objective time, clock time, or Newton's absolute time is relation-based like all other forms of time. And that is followed by an argument about objective time. Uh, first, the social relations that support and validate clock time as objective time over and against all others are those of the commodity economy, ultimately the production of commodities by way of capital investments and wage labor. Um, and then Uchiyama finds the, an intellectual support for this view in a metaphysics of substance, which he believes is deeply ingrained in Western thought. Um, and as a consequence and an immunization strategy of this reified view of time, alternative temporal relations are then projected into the subject. He then... Um, gives an argument from alternatives um, and he goes a long way to describe alternative relations of productions like uh, those in the mountain village he lives in which engender a different participative mode of time with varying morphologies. And the differentia specifica of this alternative mode of production is that it is geared toward producing life value instead of exchange and or use values. Life value foregrounds the inherent qualities of production as a node of relations within the social community and with nature. And his conclusion is that in order to break with the dominance of externalized clock time, different modes of production akin to those in his mountain village must be sought out and implemented. As I am running against the clock here, I cannot explain and evaluate Uchiyama's argument in full. Instead, I will focus on two aspects. First, the relation of commodity production and external reified time. And second, the relation of life value production and embedded relational time. The first aspect, time and commodity production, is not specific to Uchiyama. It was first brought up by Karl Marx in the first volume of Capital and has been explained in some detail in Japan by Maki Yusuke and in the Germano and Anglophone world by Moshe Postone. However, the relevant argument is often misrepresented and not as well known as it deserves. The second aspect, time and the production of life value, offers a glimpse to an alternative view, especially when read with an eye to the important distinction between life value and use value. More on that later. First, commodity production and the reification of time. In the ideal world of an extortion-free commodity economy, economic goods are produced to be sold as commodities on the free market. 
Labor is also sold on the market primarily by those who are not in command of other means of production, the proletariat. The important point is that labor is sold in a specific form. It is sold as the right to use the seller's labor power for a specific time. This opens the way for the extraction of surplus value by way of a fair exchange. The reason is that the value of each commodity is commensurate to the amount of socially necessary labor time needed for its production. Labor power is bought at its value, the monetary amount necessary to cover the expenses needed for its reproduction. And that, as an aside, includes everything. It, it includes renting apartments, um, supporting the people who do the care work without being paid for it, and um, as well as buying uh, food and other things that one needs. So labor power is bought at this value, but it is used by its buyer to produce more than its own value. Time is again of the essence because the surplus value the buyer of labor time can rightfully extract is determined by the ratio of the time necessary to reproduce the labor power and the socially necessary labor time expended for the production of the commodities in question. That ratio can be improved by diminishing the reproduction costs of labor power or it is improved by increasing the amount of commodities generated in the course of the labor time bought. This may be done by extending that time at no additional cost or by intensifying labor that is increasing the speed of production. The ratio in the end can be improved by a combination of any or all of these measures. But improved it must be because under conditions of free competition on the market, the socially necessary labor time for the production of any commodity is always bound to shrink. Extra profits go to those that achieve to produce more in less time, creating the race for heightened productivity that has led to the explosion of goods available to those with money to buy them we have witnessed in the past 250 years. On each and every level, those involved in the commodity economy are bound to refer to time as an external quantitative factor. Commodified labor power is sold by units of time. Exchange value of labor power and of goods and services available on the market is commensurate to units of time. Surplus value depends on the ratio between the labor time needed to reproduce labor power and the total labor time expended in the process of production. Time, a factor measured in standardized units, is ultimately the reference scale of every activity, of every good, of everything that enters the sphere of economic activity, a sphere that continues to expand and embrace virtually every aspect of human life. Excuse me. As I mentioned, this is basically an argument inherent in Marx's analysis of the value form in volume one of Capital. By and large, Uchiyama gets that argument right, although curiously, he never quotes Capital directly and even accuses Marx of relying on a substantialist logic, uh, which, he, which shows that he obviously has never read the seminal chapter on commodity fetishism in Capital Volume 1. Very curious indeed. Uh, he could also have read Hiro Matsuwataru's Bushokaron no Kozu, um, but apparently also doesn't know that book. That and Uchiyama's penchant to identify Western thought as a problem aside, he importantly illustrates in a later chapter why it is commodity production 
and not more mere commodity exchange that institutes this social externalization of time. And he can draw on his experience in the mountain villages in that regard. The mountain villages have sold excess product for centuries as a means to support their livelihood, but without submitting to the logic of value production and its intrinsic reference to externalized homogeneous time as a mere quantum. That brings us to the alternative described in Uchiyama's book, The Modality of Time in Life Value Production. Before I go into that, let me just remind you that Uchiyama's observations can thus serve as counter evidence and antidote to ideas of the likes of Karatani Kojin and other followers of the UNO school who want to save the world by merely changing the modes of exchange. So, what is life value production? And what modality of time is instituted by it? I find most important the remark Uchiyama makes at the beginning of chapter 6, referencing the work of Tonoe Hikotaro, where he says, life value is not use value. Use value, mind you, is the twin of exchange value. It is what consumers buy commodities for. First, their practical usefulness for a given task or purpose, but second, also all that is announced and packaged with the community. Pleasure, prestige, participation in trends and fashions, and so on. The idea that one could simply strip commodities off their exchange value by changing the mode of allocation and rest with the production and exchange of pure use values is a theoretical illusion and practically a straightforward recipe for disaster. Life value, in contrast, relates to a mode of production that treats the task of production as a node connecting producers the social and material environment. Work in this mode is an opportunity to sustain and improve everyone's lives. Life value production cherishes the quality of the process as well as that of the result as ends in themselves. Uchiyawa once more quotes from Tono Uwe, the example of late Meiji period craftsmen who would destroy a product if it didn't meet their own aspirations regardless of what the buyer said. So even if the buyer said, I'm, I can use that chair, but it wasn't good enough, uh, these craftsmen would simply destroy it and take the time to make another one. Time passed in life value production is part and parcel of one's life, an expression of one's abilities, the conditions of the occasion, the connection with others participating in the process. To use an expression from E.P. Thompson's famous article, Time, Work, Discipline, and Industrial Capitalism, time is past in life value production. It is not spent. Time is not accounted for against an external measure. Time pressures may exist, impending bad weather, the changes of the seasons, an upcoming holiday for which things must get ready, but they are inherent to the logic of the task itself and do not result from merely counting time. Time changes its qualities according to the task and the conditions of the occasion, as sometimes things move more smoothly and other times are more adverse. Uchiyama, drawing on Yanagida Seizan, further mentions the interstices that arise when a process is interrupted for whatever reason if only for looking at the sun. Taken together, all that creates a rhythm that is meaningful to those living within it. And now it's time for some final qualifications and already the conclusion. If all that sounds too good to be true, that may well be because Uchiyama writes from a position where the said mode of production remains on the margins of a liberal democratic state and does not dominate society. Partly for that reason, the question of power 
and social dominance in life value production is conspicuously absent in a book that is otherwise replete with references to Marxist thought. Uchiyama states that he does not propose a return to the past, but he remains silent about how exactly his mode of life value production distinguishes itself in social and political terms from pre-capitalist forms of social organization, where the violent suppression of the larger parts of participants in the process of production was the order and not the exception, as were forceful extortion, hunger, and disease. While Uchiyama's observations are thought-provoking, any attempt to further them, develop them, would need to get rid of his tendency to fall back into bourgeois civilization critique. Most importantly, one needs to stay clear of futile distinctions between Western, atomistic, and Eastern holistic thought and false characterizations of capitalist production as rational versus life value production as irrational and so on. What is valuable in Uchiyama is precisely that he describes the rationality peculiar to life value production and its concomitant ways to experience, make sense of, and live time. Thank you very much. Let's see if there are some um, questions from uh, the either audiences here. I'll call up my Zoom. Yes. Please, Raquel. Um, for Uchiyama, objective time is also a form of a, a mode of society to relate to the environment and produce a certain form of time. And so other forms of time are not subjective, but they are they emerge from a different mode of relating to the environment and relations within society. And a strong part of his book is when he goes on to describe his um, experiences in this mountain village where he is also living, um, where he shows that according to the task at hand, and the circumstances, time can, for example, move at different speeds. It can apparently stop or break off and then be resumed. Um, and that is not, it's not subjective, but it is a reality that emerges between every part of the process that is involved in the process. And then he, he has a chapter where he describes different times of fishing or of cultivating the forest. Um, in forest cultivation, he talks about the interaction of different cycles in the forest. So, for example, to produce sansai, um, you need to, to cut the trees in the forest every 12 years or 20, no, 20 to 25 years. And then there is a cycle of six to seven years until the sansai emerges. And so there is, um, there is this cycle. Um, and then after a certain period, again, you can either, so uh, like every once in one or two generations, you need to cut all the trees and cultivate the land. And so, so he describes how there are various layers of cyclicities plus linear time moving through it as one of his examples. Okay. Uh, 
uh, other, other oops sorry uh, please Luis I, I guess that the Amara does not say anything about the famous Augustinian, the place in, in time. It's in Augustine. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it says, I quote, well, there is time. If no one asks me, I know what it is. If I wish to explain it to him who asks, I do not know. I, I understand this complexity of Augustine. So I, I think I have no idea what time it is. But I have an experience of time that most people writing at my age <laughs> agree with. When I was a child or young, you know, I thought about next four years. Ooh, that's very long. How, how the experience of this for even a summer, a vacation summer was something very long. Now it's uh, as, as a particular experience, and I think many people will agree, uh, like an entire experience, uh, is uh, everything short. Then my question would be uh, probably Uchiyama does not say anything about this, but if he does, would you tell us? And if not, what would you think about this? Is there an extra one? <laughs> okay, so um, Uchiyama has this chapter five on relational versus objective time. And I think his notion of relational time relates to your question uh, because there he also explains why uh, this difficulty to explain time arises from the difficulty that we have that we always want to find an intuitive image of time. Um, but there is none. Because the, the temporal relations that we are trying to grasp are too complex to put them into one image alone. So uh, the experience that you describe is an experience of, of, very, of the relation of various factors. So when, you, when, when we are young, the time that we've already experienced is still comparatively short, and we measure the time ahead of us in relation to the time that we've already lived. When we get older, we become more aware of the limit of our own life, and we've also already lived through more experiences. Also, we make less new experiences, which is also important. Um, so, so I think his notion of relational time can very well explain this difficulty that Augustine describes, um, but also these experiences you were referring to. A very nice point. I just had to write that down. So, um, other other thoughts, if please. So, like, I wouldn't ask 
the what do you think about the relationship between Iran and Israel? Um, the So, um, on on a on a concrete level, Uchiyama, when he describes um, the the time of this mountain village where he lives in, and I I just have to say again, this is a post land reform modern Japanese village operating under very specific conditions. It's not a pre modern village. Okay, there is no daimyo around, no landlord uh, who owns all the land and you have to race to get um, whatever you owe him to him and so on. So, um, obviously because it's an agricultural village, the relationship to the land plays an important role and unfortunately he doesn't really have a chapter on city life and but you could, I think you can extend that kind of argument. So what does it mean, for example, if you don't own a piece of land where you live? So you rent, you live in a rented apartment. Um, then you have a certain time frame, for example, like if, if the owner of the place wants you to get out, um, how many months notice do you have? That, you see, that already creates a certain relationship. If you live in a job where you expect that in probably in a couple of years you will move away, it's the big expect problem in a city like Zurich, for example, that such a big part of the population comes in, lives there for five years or three years, and then they move on. So they never really develop any local ties. There is no real incentive to engage in with the place, to cultivate the place, because you know you will be gone and what happens afterwards is not important to you. So in that regard, I would say since we are spatial beings, we require a place to live the way the whole thing is organized and our living space is available to us has an important relationship to time. The, this UNO point about the Muri, I think that's a mystification. So I would leave that out of this discussion. Okay, um, there, there is one more question in the chat, but un unfortunately we I think are really coming to the limits of our time uh, because now we have to have a small break before the next session. Um, but you may want to, it's from Ralph Muller, and you may want to um, privately and, and respond to him. Um, but okay, so let's give a round of applause to all of our participants again. Thank you so much. <laughs>